Okay, let's get started. Hello, everybody. So we are up to class number two in our, uh, sorry, this is not what I want, in our synagogue series. Let's go back to the beginning. Um, and today we are going to be traveling up north, traveling without a bus, very good, nice and easy. Um, and what we're going to do is there are many, 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 as we're going to see in a moment on a map, many synagogues in the north, in the Galilee, in the Golan, uh, the great majority of ancient synagogues were discovered up there. Um, we are talking mostly Roman Byzantine times. We're going to take a look at a timeline in a minute. Um, and we are going to be traveling, traveling virtually uh, around the Kinneret, around the Sea of Galilee, and get a sense of the variety of synagogues that are there and continuing to explore what synagogues can teach us about communities. But we also want to take a look at dating of synagogues uh, and, and everything else. Sound, it seems like everybody is getting except for Judy, right? People are hearing me, just do a thumbs up. That's good. Okay, uh, and sources are in the chat. So you can take a look in the chat. Yes, try leaving and coming back in. That tends to work for most technical problems. Okay, so um, we are looking at uh, the beautiful synagogue of Korazim. We're gonna be coming back to Korazim. But first, let's get to our themes, what we want to be talking about today. OK, so first of all, a, a very, very big question in the study of ancient synagogues is chronology, right? When were synagogues built? Can we determine this kind of stylistically? Um, the Bikorot, by the way, are at the beginning. Just scroll to the top of your chat and you'll find it. Um, can we determine by the style when does a synagogue come from, right? Uh, and we're going to explore that question a little bit. Uh, spoiler alert, we're going to find out that we don't really know, right? It, it's still very much an open question. Theories that many great archaeologists had, the more we find, the less we are really seeing that these theories hold up because we're finding some that don't fit with the chronology. Uh, and, and this is a question that is still uh, that is still standing that we're still trying to understand. Uh, another thing we're going to look at are some of the great Jewish communities of the North and their challenges. Um, one of the things that uh, that is important to understand is that the North is uh, is fascinating in the sense that we just keep finding more stuff. Okay, it's incredibly, incredibly rich. We're going to talk about why Jewish life moves to the north. Anybody who was in the class on the Mishnah that knows that we, we spoke about that. Um, but we just keep finding more things, most of the time by accident, right? Most of the time because a new road has to be paved uh, or a community is expanding. And imagine what we could find if we could do it systematically. Of course, we can't, right? But, but we are finding more and more exciting things, uh, more new discoveries. On the other hand, what are the challenges we don't have Jerusalem anymore by the time we have the synagogues in the north. How do you remember Jerusalem? How do you remember the temple? How do the rabbis um, approach the people and how much do the people accept the rabbis? So that's going to be another question we're going to get to. And that leads us to our last theme, which is what does the Torah think about imagery? And how is that halacha interpreted over time? And anybody who's ever been to any of the great synagogues in the north, if we're talking about Beit Alpha or Tsipori or Hamat Tveria, you know that you have mosaics with imagery that uh, perhaps would make many of us uncomfortable if it was in Orthodox synagogues that we go to today. So how are these laws interpreted over time? What does that show us about the community? Okay, so those are some of the themes we're going to be discussing. Um, let's uh, put ourselves in a time period because if last time we talked about uh, first temple times and the uh, the plethora of different places that people wanted to worship and how that transitioned in second temple times to temple in Jerusalem, synagogues and other places. Now we really want to be talking about post temple altogether, right? So uh, just to kind of ground us again, the year 66 to 70, of course, we have the great revolt against the Romans. We're talking about the common era here. Okay. Temple is destroyed in the year 70. We have the fallout from the revolt lasting till 73, right? When Masada falls. Um, and, and just putting in, in, uh, in the italics here, the non-Jewish leaders, 
right? So you have the Roman emperors, the Flavian dynasty, Vespasian and Titus, who are the guys who are responsible for the conquest of Jerusalem, Domitian, right? But in terms of Jewish uh, dynamics, what's happening? The temple is destroyed, Jerusalem is destroyed, and we have the brilliance of Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, who comes along and says, we can create a portable Judaism, we pray for the temple to be rebuilt, we want to return to Jerusalem, but meanwhile, we have Yavne v'chachameh, right? We're going to take the teachers, the rabbis, the Sanhedrin, we're going to move it to Yavne, and we're going to be able to continue teaching, okay? Um, again, we have what are called, in Roman history anyway, the five good emperors, and not all of them are good for us, certainly not Hadrian um, or Trajan. We have the revolt in the diaspora, the Trajan revolt, which we don't know so much about, but what's important to us in the land of Israel is the very devastating story of the Bar Kokhba revolt, right? Hadrian becomes the emperor. He's a very powerful emperor. Uh, he wants to create kind of a one culture for the Roman empire. He comes to visit the land of Israel. It seems he begins to turn Jerusalem into the pagan city of Elia Capitolina. Um, and through various decrees and the things that seem to endanger Jewish values, Jewish life, we have the story of the Bar Kokhba revolt, led, of course, by Shimon Bar Kokhba or Bar Koziba, but the spiritual leader is Rabbi Akiva. Okay? The story of the Bar Kokhba revolt, while the, the ideas behind it are very powerful, right, that we don't want to be like the Romans, it, it is a terrible, terrible failure and disaster. Um, and what the great revolts and destruction of the temple did not do, which is push Jews out of Judea, the Bar Kokhba revolt does do, right? And Judea is so completely destroyed and Jerusalem becomes off limits to Jews that Jewish life goes to the north. So now we're talking about the Sanhedrin, right? When the Sanhedrin moves north to these various stations, Ushash, Faram, Beit Sharim, Tzipori, Tveria, but we also have communities that move north. Now we have communities already in the Galilee and the Golan during the time of the temple before that, but now these communities become the central communities of the Jews. And that's why we're finding so many synagogues, so many places. OK, so that's uh, that's something that's important to understand. And this time period we're going to say ends with the redaction of the Mishnah. But our synagogues that we are going to be looking at today, we're going to look at some early ones and some later ones. Uh, Migdal is a very early one. We alluded to it a little bit last week, uh, already destroyed by uh, by 50 CE. OK, so before the temple is even destroyed, the synagogue in Migdal is destroyed. That's the earliest we're going to look at. Kfar Nachum, where the dating is a very big question. We'll discuss that. Korazin. Korazim is a Jewish city between the first and the seventh century of the Common Era. When It's actually a Jewish city even before that. When is the synagogue built? That's a great question. Uh, Wadi Hamam is one of the earlier synagogues destroyed in the fourth century and Kulkok from the fourth to the sixth century. If your mind is reeling from all the dates, don't worry, we're gonna review some of them. Uh, but we are talking about a, a lot of different time periods that these synagogues are in. I just wanted to have a general sense of destruction of the temple, Bar Kokhba revolt, redaction of the Mishnah, just to kind of put us in, uh, in time, right? In time, let's put ourselves in space, okay? So the Galilee is uh, a center that is rather different than the center in Judea, okay? And, and we have various interesting references to that in rabbinic literature, right? So on the one hand, uh, it seems to be a community that's less familiar with the temple and with the laws of purity and with the temple laws. They seem to speak Hebrew less, and we see that in the inscriptions. We're going to do a class where, uh, where we're going to talk about inscriptions. Uh, inscriptions tell us a lot, uh, including what language people spoke. So Greek, Aramaic, much more common in the Galil. In Judea, Hebrew is much more common. Um, does that mean they were more less educated? That used to be the, the thought in the scholarship today. We're not necessarily saying that. Um, it, it's it's probably it's differently educated, right? They might not have been so careful about asking the rabbis questions, but they do seem to have known a lot. Um, one of the things that the, the Gemara emphasizes, which is fascinating, is that the people of the Galilee, as opposed to the people of Judea, are more modest. Okay, they're more careful about 
can an engaged couple sleep in the same house, right? In Judea, that's like so okay. And in the galley, oh no, don't do that. That's a very big no-no, right? They also seem to be a little bit straighter. The Gemara kind of alludes to that, that they're a little bit more honest in the Galilee than in, than in Judea. So we kind of have these broad strokes, but on the other hand, it, it's a little hard to, um, to stereotype, right? To generalize, not to stereotype, because you have so many different types of communities. You have actually all the way over here, you don't see it because it's not on my map, but you have big cities, right? Like Caesarea, right over here, or like Beichan, also not on my map, sorry, <laughs> down here, right? Or like Tsipori, mm, right here, even though not written on my map, okay? These are big, cosmopolitan mixed cities, Jews and non-Jews. You have large cities which are mostly Jewish, right? Like Tiberias, okay? And then you also have tons of little villages like Migdal, like Korazim, like Far Nahum, right? And, and many, many, many others. So it, it's a very varied area and you can't really generalize because the people in the big city of Beichan are not like the people in the small town of Migdal. Uh, and the demographics are different, just like you can't say, oh, America is like this. Well, hello, New York is like this, and Idaho is like that, and Los Angeles is like that. These are different types of communities in different types of places. Um, we are going to be visiting, like we said, Migdal, Kfar Nahum, Korazim, uh, Chukok, and Wadi Hamam, which are right here. Uh, and I think that's it. Maybe something else, but that's the basic idea. Okay, so that's just to understand where we are. We did a little when we are. Now we know where we are. Um, but this is an amazing map. Okay, this is a map that is not even up to date. It's from about 20 years ago, I think. Um, synagogues, ancient synagogues that have been discovered in Israel. And you can see this incredible, incredible concentration in the Galil and in the Golan. We're going to talk about the Golan. That's going to be our last class. We'll do a special class on the Golan because the Golan is fascinating. We're just staying in the Galil today. But look how many, and these are just the ones that have been discovered, right? And there clearly are more that are hiding under the surface that are waiting for us to discover them, okay? Where do you have much fewer? You have much fewer in Samaria, in Shomron, because that's the area that's ruled by the Samaritans, the Shomronim. You have Samaritan synagogues. You don't have Jewish synagogues, right? You have another concentration down here in the southern Hebron Hills, right? Drom Har Hebron. While Judea is essentially emptied out, uh, there are people who move down to the southern Hebron Hills. So that is part of the story. But the major, major concentration uh, is here in the Galilee. And what's fascinating is we're finding communities and in every Jewish community, every community that we could identify as a Jewish community, we're finding a synagogue, meaning every community found it a priority to put aside money to build a synagogue, okay? And that already tells us quite a lot about the state of the Jews in this post-temple world, that the synagogue is a major, major priority because what the community puts aside money for, that's what it cares about, okay? And if we wanna say they're using the synagogue to pray, but also to teach and also to gather. And as a community organization, a community center, then this is telling us you have a strong Jewish community and these are their priorities. This is what's important for them. And we're gonna see that in most communities, the synagogue is the most fabulous building in the whole place, okay? Um, this, like I said, is a constantly changing map. We are always, always finding more stuff and, and surprises. The Galilee is full of surprises. So uh, it, it's an exciting place in terms of archeology. span um, Okay, we are also gonna see, and we'll see this particularly in Kfar Nahum, um, that, this is a place where we have Judaism, rabbinic Judaism, uh, and Christianity, both are developing here, right? They're all growing out of the same Jewish community, 
At a certain point, they are going very much to diverge, but they're growing out of the same communities. And, that, and, and I, the example that I brought you, the visual example is a great example. Uh, a few years ago, Israel decided that not all Christian pilgrims want to go around on tour buses. There are quite a lot of people who like to hike, who like nature, who want to be outdoors. And so they created what they call the gospel trail, which is a hiking trail that goes from various important events in the New Testament connected to Jesus' life, right? From Nazareth, Kafir Kana, right? Going all the way up to Kfar Nahum. Um, and Jews, rightly said, well, that's all well and good. That's very nice. But, you know, there's also a lot of Jewish history in the Galilee. Perhaps we could create a Sanhedrin trail, right? A trail that follows in the stations of the Sanhedrin, where were the rabbis? And indeed, uh, Israel has done that and, it, and it's finished and it's a very cool thing. Um, but it just tells us that these two developing communities are coexisting, they're growing side by side. Um, and um, we're gonna see this most clearly in Kfar Nachum. And perhaps this is the reason why uh, by Byzantine times, a lot of synagogues are very simple on the outside, very fancy on the inside, meaning once Christianity becomes the established religion, Jews have to start laying low. But again, we're not up to our chronology there yet. So now, now let's talk a little about chronology. Okay, so we're looking at two very different types of synagogues. Uh, and these were used by early scholars as kind of in a typology of how to date synagogues. So uh, this one is Barab, all the way in the far, far north, right? The upper Galilee, uh, very, very impressive, beautiful facade with a very rather simple inside, okay? This is the synagogue of Beit Alpha, which I'm sure some people have seen uh, with its incredibly beautiful, fabulous mosaic inside. Uh, and we're gonna talk about mosaics that look like this with the Zodiac uh, and the Akedah with the binding of Isaac but it has a very elaborate inside and a rather simple outside, right? Uh, and the earliest, the earlier theory about dating synagogues, these are earlier archeologists called Cole and Watzinger. And they said, earlier synagogues, synagogues that are from Roman times, right? Their Roman pagan period, they have these incredibly fabulous facades, right? Like Barab, because A, this is the style, right? Jews are always following the style of what other people are doing. We don't come up with everything on our own. We might imbue it with special content, but we're, we're certainly looking at the world around us. So this is the Roman style to build these very elaborate, fabulous facades. And number two, this is a pagan world and Jews have less to fear in a pagan world, right? So they said the earlier synagogues, ah, those are the ones that have these big facades. Later on, as the Byzantines come to power, as Christianity comes to power, Jews start to kind of collapse into themselves. They don't want to be seen. You don't want the first building that you see when you come into the town to be the synagogue. We want to lie low. And so we make these very beautiful. We're still spending money. We're still making things very beautiful. However, you don't necessarily see it from the outside, right? And I'm sure many of us are familiar with synagogues like this in Europe where they're modest on the outside because we don't want to attract so much attention to ourselves, right? So that was the theory that the early ones are these massive, fabulous outside, very simple inside. The later ones are simple outside, very fancy inside. It's very nice, but it doesn't always work, right? First of all, we have very few synagogues that are earlier than the fourth century. And the fourth century is already Byzantine times, Christianity. So most of the synagogues we're looking at, okay, they're from that Christian time and we have both styles. Um, and some really cross the lines, right? And some are very late, but they're very elaborate. We're gonna see the example of Kfar Nahum. So then there was a different theory. They said, okay, maybe it's a regional difference, not a chronological difference, right? Maybe in the mountains, we do this kind of fancy outside, but down in the valleys, we do this mosaic and the simple outside. That doesn't work either. Uh, and we're still trying to figure out this question of how do we date the synagogues? Is there a certain type that we're looking for? Uh, and the more we find, right, the more data we have that we can figure it out. We're going to see a little bit later. We're going to look at the synagogue in Wadi Hamam. Wadi Hamam is a very interesting synagogue because it's the oldest synagogue that has these fabulous mosaics, right? It's already destroyed by the fourth century, but it has beautiful mosaics. So maybe that can give us a little bit of clues into how we date synagogues. But as of yet, 
it's still very much an open question in the literature. So we're mentioning it, but we're not solving the problem. Now we're going to take a look at a few different sites. Okay, so Migdal we looked at last time, but really, really very briefly, we're going to see some sources about Migdal. Migdal, as you may recall from a few minutes ago, right? Migdal is right here on the shores of the Kinara. It's about 10 minutes north of Tiberias, right, okay, right over here. Um, there's a Jewish community there, but across the street, right on the shores of the Kinara, there were already excavations that were done by Franciscan priests in the 19th century. Um, and they found a very established, very planned city. Now, why are they excavating there? We're gonna see in the sources in a minute, Migdal, or as it's called in the New Testament, Magdala, is an important place for Christians and the name was retained. And so the Franciscans came and they said, well, what can we find here, right? So they found uh, a bathhouse and they found a port and they found uh, all kinds of fishing equipment. They found the city that's already existing in the first century BCE, okay? Um, but then there's a new excavation that's made. And we're going to tell the story of it in a minute, but this is the most important thing that's found there. There's a nice aerial view of the synagogue. Just this past year, they discovered a second early synagogue, and it's really amazing. Okay, what's the story behind the excavation? How do we distinguish synagogues from churches? I just looked in the chat briefly. That's very easy. Churches have crosses. Synagogues do not. Um, and not to sound facetious, but churches almost always have crosses, right? Synagogues don't always have menorahs, but they often, often do. Okay, plus other things that we're going to see. Um, it's not by architecture, by the way. Uh, often, certainly in the later synagogues, they have a similar design, right? They have a similar style. It's called the Basilica style. We're going to see it in some of the other synagogues we're going to look at here. But let's go back to, well, we'll talk about the discovery of Migdal, but let's take a look at the sources for a minute, why this is such a big deal for Christians, okay? So Migdal has a few different names. It appears both in Jewish sources and in Christian sources, okay? Uh, in in Jewish sources, it has a few names. Uh, it's called Migdal. It's also called Migdal Nunya. Nun in Aramaic means a fish. Uh, it's the tower of fish, right? It's the fish tower. Uh, fish, fish and catching fish and selling fish is a very important industry on the Sea of Galilee and it certainly is here. And that brings us to a different name that it has is Josephus's name for it, Tarikea, which literally means salted fish. Do you want to come from a town that's called Herring? I don't know, but that's what they are, right? They're coming from the salted fish town, right? And Magdala is the Greek translation of the of the same word migdal okay so we have references to it in the gemara i didn't bring anything here from the gemara but the gemara definitely sees it as a place that's very close to tveria but we have some very important references to it both in the new testament and in josephus so let's take a look for a minute uh, at the new testament right uh in the book of luke Certain women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, out of whom went seven devils, and Joanna, the wife of Chuzah, Herod Stewart, and Susanna, and many others, which ministered unto him of their substance. Now, this is very interesting. You might not get this from the text, but these women, Mary or Mary Magdalene, who the Gemara also mentions, by the way, and the Gemara likes to play around and get confused between Mary, Jesus's mother, and Mary Magdalene, and Mary, who's a hair cutter, and Mary, who's a prostitute. And, and the Gemara is for sure like making fun and play. Um, but here, what do we find out about these women? Mary, Mary and Joanna and Susanna, Shoshana, they ministered to him of their substance, meaning these are wealthy women. Okay, these are women who happen to have their own money, right? Their own, uh, their own pocket money. And they're using it to support Jesus. So that's already giving you a sense, what is this town? This is a town that's wealthy enough that even the women have some money to put on the side to give to this guy who's coming around to the town, right? Now, Mary, why is Mary such a big deal? Jesus has a lot of followers because Mary is the one who show, finds out that Jesus flew the coop and he's not in the sepulcher at three days after he's been buried, right? And that's the book of John. That's not happening in Migdal. That's happening down in Judea in a place called Emmaus. The first day of the week comes Mary Magdalene early when it was yet dark into the sepulcher and sees the stone taken away from the sepulcher, right? This is three days after Jesus is buried. She ran, ran and came to St. Peter, to Simon Peter and the other disciples whom Jesus loved and said to them, they have taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher and we know not where they have laid him, right? So this is a very big deal because this is proof that Jesus 
has come back to life. So Mary Magdalene, super, super important. Uh, forget about, you know, what happens with her in stupid John Brown novels, but in, um, but in the New Testament, she's a very significant figure, and it explains to you why people are interested uh, in talking about, uh, about finding things in, in Migdal, in Magdala. And we also hear that Jesus comes and preaches in the synagogue in Migdal. Josephus talks about uh, a few decades later, right, when there's the Great Revolt. And Vespasian comes to uh, attack in the Galilee, and the people of Migdal, after they are kind of pushed out of their town, they continue to fight the Romans on the lake, right, on the Kineret. They sail onto the lake, and the Romans follow them. I will just read a little bit, but now when the vessels were gotten ready, Vespasian put upon shipboard as many of his forces as he thought sufficient to be for the, too hard for those that were upon the lake and set sail after them. Now these which were driven into the lake could neither fly to the land, which is in their enemy's hand anymore against him, nor could they fight upon the level by sea, right? And, and they're basically stuck, right? It's a very terrible story. Uh, and many of them are drowned or taken prisoner, but this is the people of Migdal who are very great patriots fighting against, uh, fighting against the Romans in the great result they're very much going to lose, but they, they put up a very good fight. So here's where we get the sense of Migdal as a very important place on the Kinneret, part of this whole complex of communities around the Kinneret. Um, many of them are you know, people who are workers, farmers, fishermen, right? And some of them will become the disciples of Jesus. Now, what happens next is... Uh, well, if we want to jump quite a lot forward, okay, so there is a, uh, a Mexican Catholic priest whose name was fa is Father Juan Solana, uh, and he knew about the excavations at, at Magdala, the Franciscan excavations, which have finished in like the 70s, um, and he says, this is such an important site, I want to come, I want to buy some of this land, and I want to build a Christian retreat center and a church and a hotel so people can come and connect to the stories of Jesus. Okay, very nice. State of Israel says you want to do that, you have the money, that's great. However, you can only do that if you do an excavation first, because who knows, you might find something. So Father Solana goes to the Antiquities Authority, they assign a Muslim Israeli Arab to excavate, okay? Um, his name is Najar Arfan, and he calls up Father Solana a few weeks into the dig, and he says, listen, I've got bad news and good news. The bad news is that your church and your retreat center are not going to be finished anytime soon. Okay. Um, the good news is that uh, we seem to have found the church that Jesus preached in. Right. We seem to have found the, the church, the synagogue, excuse me. Uh, we seem to have found the synagogue that existed in Migdal in the first century of the common era, right? And that's an amazing, amazing thing. So here we have this Catholic who is funding the whole story, right? It's uh, an archaeologist who's an Israeli Arab, uh, and he's finding a synagogue, and it's just a great combination. What does he find, right? What does he find? He finds a small synagogue, not a particularly impressive synagogue, but a small synagogue that's actually very richly decorated. It's on the edge of the town, right near the market of the town, right, where there's all this um, salted fish. I, I put on this live transcript because somebody asked for it, but I think you should be able to turn it off for yourself, although I have not figured out how to turn it off for myself. Um, <laughs> and it's annoying me, but I, I hear if it annoys people. Play around and try to turn it off. Whoever's mic is on, please turn it off. Um, okay, but what's exciting about the synagogue. The synagogue itself is interesting, but it looks a lot like the other synagogues we have from this time period, from Herodian, from Masada. Um, um, and it has benches, it has uh, frescoes, beautiful paint on the walls, it has some mosaics that have survived. But what's really very strange is this stone that was discovered. Okay, what's the deal with this stone? It's hard to tell from this picture. Might be able to tell here, you can tell better from this picture. Uh, it's very low. OK, it's very low. It's too low to be a chair. It's too low to be a table. It is very beautifully decorated. And as you can see, it's beautifully decorated with things that are connected to the temple, right, to the Beit HaMikdash, most obviously the menorah. OK, but you also have these nice 
pitchers, which could have been for pouring out water, for pouring out wine, oil, right? All those things happen in the temple. You have these beautiful pillars. Uh, on the top, you have rosettes. On the other side, you have things that look sort of like doorways or archways. This all seems to be reminiscent of the temple. Uh, and there are all kinds of theories about what this was. Maybe it was something that a Torah scroll was put on. Maybe it was a special seat. We don't really know. The only thing that seems clear is that this stone is sitting here because the people in Migdal want you when you come to the temple, to the synagogue, to think about Jerusalem, right? We're very far away, very far away from Jerusalem. Jerusalem is a good two, three days journey. Are you going on pilgrimage? Maybe, but you wanna be thinking about Jerusalem. You wanna be connecting to it all the time. And this is a way for you to do that. And we see that theme in, in lots of different synagogues in the Galilee. They want to connect to Jerusalem. They want to be part, they want that to be part of their, uh, of their prayer, right? And, and, that's, uh, and that's a very powerful idea. So that's Migdal. We are going to move on to Kfar Nahum, which is one of the more mysterious uh, places. We're going to see the sources in a minute. Okay, it's a Jewish town from already the time of the Hasmoneans, right? Second century before the Common Era. Um, it lasts until the eighth century of the Common Era when there's a huge earthquake uh, in the land of Israel and many, many things change. Um, the question about facing Jerusalem, again, is, uh, is an interesting question. We mentioned it last time. It doesn't always happen. Sometimes it depends on topography. Some of them do, some of them don't. Later ones mostly do, okay? Um, now, Kfar Nahum was clearly a Jewish town, okay? It has lots of Jewish symbols, uh, menorah, right? Different menorahs, um, different uh, other Jewish motifs. Last time I showed you guys at the end, the picture of the Ark on wheels, right? If you remember that, that comes from Kfar Nahum. Um, there are a lot of other things that show us that this was, at least in early days, a Jewish town. Now, when you go to Kfar Nahum today, Kfar Nahum is actually, uh, run by the Franciscans. They are the ones who excavated it and they are the ones who uh, who maintain the site. And that's when you come in, it says Capernaum, the town of Jesus. <laughs> okay, um, why is it the town of Jesus? So let's take a look at a few of our sources here. Um, so we have, Kfar Nahum is actually mentioned in a few different places in the gospels where Jesus shows up and he preaches in Kfar Nahum and he heals people in Kfar Nahum. Now, this is going to be very important because we're going to want to ask the question of who is living here, right? There Are they Jews? Are they Christians? Are they Jewish Christians? Are they both side by side? So bear with me for another couple of uh, New Testament sources, and, and that will be it for today for New Testament. Um, but, uh, but it's important to know, right? So in Matthew, we have the story of Jesus, right? He goes to the Galilee. He leaves Nazareth. He came to Kfar Nahum on the borders of Zvulun and Naphtali, right? Et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and he goes to preach and repent. And in walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brethren, Simon and Andrew, his brother. And this is a very famous scene, casting a net into the sea for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men, right? Not fishermen, but fishers of men, okay? And these are the beginnings of his disciples. And he says, come with me. And he goes around and he cures people. And then we have another story in the book of Luke where he goes to Kfar Nahum and he's teaching on Shabbat, meaning he's going into the synagogue and he's teaching, okay? And they were astounded at his teaching. He spoke with authority. In the synagogue, there was a man with the spirit of an unclean demon. And he cried out with a loud voice. What do you have to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth, right? So what did he have an unclean demon? demon or was he a heckler? Who knows, right? But Jesus says, be silent and come out of him. So he has to exercise the demon. <laughs> and then he goes to Simon's house and he heals Simon's mother. And anybody who's sick, he shows up and he heals them. Okay, so why do we care about all this? Because this tells us that Kfar Nahum is a very important place for early Christianity. It's a place where Jesus comes and preaches. It's a place where he has disciples. Uh, and it's a place where he comes and he heals people. So he's going to have followers here. Now, this is clearly a Jewish town, okay? And in this Jewish town, there is a very fabulous synagogue, right? Um, it, it's got these huge pillars. It's got this gorgeous facade, right? It's all these things that we talked about, about being a very early synagogue, 
right? And, and that would be very nice because that would fit with the story of Jesus being there and he could preach there and Jews are here and very nice. And there are houses right nearby. And this is a lovely Jewish town with a big, big synagogue. That works beautifully if we say this is a first, second century synagogue. Lovely, except what happened when they excavated this again, they discovered under the floor 25,000 coins from the fourth century. Okay, what the heck is going on here? Why do you put coins under the floor? A lot of people think that um, early, some communities would put the treasure of the town or like the, you know, the savings of the town under the floor of the synagogue. That's less important to us. What's important to us is if there are fourth century coins under the synagogue, then what's on top is post fourth century, right? You can't have a second century synagogue with fourth century coins in the foundation. So the synagogue seems to be much, much later. How can that be when we know that right next door, you don't see it so clearly in this picture, but right over here on the right is a Byzantine period church. By the fourth century, Kfar Nahum has a significant population of Christians who are living, not Jewish Christians, Christians who are living here, who have built an important church because of all the stories that are here. And are we saying that in this little city, you could have a huge, impressive synagogue next to a huge impressive church are they really living side by side right does that make sense uh, and for that you have to go back to well, both our sources and their sources we're gonna we're gonna go to our sources um which talk about this early period where Jews and Christians are very close to each other. And the rabbis in this earlier period, right? Rabbi Ishmael, Rabbi Meir, who are set, Rabbi Tarfon, who are saying, ooh, separate. Don't get close to these guys because it's very dangerous. We don't want to have too much to do with them. But by the time we get to the fourth century, we're already very separated. The Christians want to separate from us and the Jews are already very separate from the Christians. And there's no more temptation of, I'm gonna hear their stuff and I'm gonna learn from them and I'm gonna become a Christian. But in these early days, we do have that temptation, right? But by the time we get to the fourth century, the likelihood that a church and a synagogue are right next door to each other, very unlikely. But let's take a look at some of these interesting sources for a minute, okay? Um, Gemara and Shabbos, I'm going to read it in the Hebrew because the words are important. Hey, Tashma, Hagil Yonin, Visifrei Haminin, Ein Mitzilin Otami Pnei Hadleka, Elanim Tzayat, and if Sarfim Bim Koman, Ein Beis Korotayim. Okay, so there's a fire on Shabbat, right? A fire on Shabbat, you can save certain things. Obviously, you can save people's lives. You, you put out the fire so that people don't die. But what if the fire is, you know, safely contained, but there's a Torah in the house? So you can put out the fire in order to save the Torah. But the Gemara says, well, what about these other books? Gilionin Visifrei Minim. What does this mean? Gilionim seems to mean papers, right? Just blank scrolls. And that's exactly what it says here. Blank spaces. Sifreminim, the books of the heretics. Now, if you go down to the very bottom of this paragraph, you have a censored part of the Gemara. You can look in Gemaras. Some Gemaras have it. Earlier Gemaras, uh, ones that were like, you know, before you looked at manuscripts, uh, don't have it because it was censored out. Rabbi Meir have a karele avon gilion. Rabbi Yochanan have a karele aven gilion. What is this gilionim? It's not blank spaces. It's evangelion, which is the gospels, right? That's the Greek word for the gospels. And the Gemara is playing on it. The falsehood of paper, the sin of paper, aven, avon, right? It's, it's, a, it's a little game that they're playing. But what we're saying is you might have these books, these gospels in your house. Don't save them from the fire. Better you should, you know, burn them all up. And that's what Rabbi Yossi says. And that's what Rabbi Tarfon says. And then we have an even more powerful story, not about paper, but about people, right? Take a look at the Gemara down the bottom here of Azara. 
right? Uh, no man should have any dealings with Minim, nor is it allowed to be healed by them. Minim is another word for early Christians, even in risking an hour's life. It once happened to Ben Dama, the son of Rabbi Ishmael's sister, right? Rabbi Ishmael's nephew. They was bitten by a serpent and Yaakov of Kfar Sachnaya, Yaakov of Kfar Sachnaya is like the classic Jewish Christian in the sources, um, came to heal him. Rabbi Ishmael did not let him. No, can't come and heal. You're a Jewish Christian. Whereupon Ben Dama said, my brother, Rabbi Shmael, let him so that I may be healed by him. I will even cite a verse from the Torah that is to be permitted. But he did not manage to complete his saying when his soul departed and he died. Whereupon Rabbi Shmael said, happy are you, Ben Dama, for you were pure in body and your soul left you in purity. Right? Better that you should die than that you should be healed by one of these Jewish Christians. So this is a time period where there's a lot of intersecting between the two groups, and the rabbis say separate. By the fourth century, that's not happening anymore. So what's going on, right? What's going on with the synagogue? Could it really have been standing? Could it really be earlier? Right. So there are various suggestions. One suggestion is it was originally, you know, it was built using recycled materials, right? But that also doesn't work because how could you have a synagogue next to a church? So one of the very interesting theories is by a, an archaeologist named Tzvika Maoz. He says this was never a, using, a synagogue that was in use. It's a crazy theory. He says the Christians who lived in Kfar Nahum, they knew all these stories about Jesus preaching in the synagogue and healing the people who came to the synagogue, and they built a synagogue as a teaching aid, right? People would come to Kfar Nahum and they say, we want to hear the story of the Gospels about Jesus in Kfar Nahum, and the people in the town would say, oh, come and see the synagogue, right? <laughs> it's fake. It wasn't the real place. They built it to look like a synagogue of the time. And, uh, and therefore, you know, it, it, it's a fourth century synagogue that's meant to look like an earlier synagogue. Take it or leave it. It's an interesting theory. Now that we found the synagogue in Migdal, that's very good for the Christians because that's a synagogue that's really from the time of Jesus. Um, Korazim is another site that is mentioned in the New Testament. We're not going to talk about it in its Christian context. Um, Korazim is up at the northern edge of the Kinneret. Uh, it's a Jewish town from the first to the eighth century of the Common Era. Most of what we find mm -hmm is from the third, fourth century. Um, it's a very classic Jewish town. It's got mikvahs. It's got a uh, large communal mikvah. It's got a Beit Bad, right, right over here, uh, an olive press, small houses that have these very classic, these windows that are actually called Korazim windows. They're, they're spaces between two rooms. Um, it has a, a, a main uh, courtyard area, not courtyard, uh, but a main area where people would gather to have uh, a market, right? All these things are very classic to a Jewish town, a mikvah being what really shows us it's a Jewish town. Uh, but at the highest point in the town, in the center of a the town, there's a very large and elaborate staircase leading up to it. You have this very fabulous stone synagogue with a beautiful structure that's created to house the Aram Kodesh, right? With elaborate stone carvings. This is a synagogue that a lot of money was poured into it. This is clearly a synagogue that was very expensive to make. Okay? And this is not a particularly fancy town, right? Magdala, we saw Migdal, seems to have been a very wealthy town. Koraz seems to have been a pretty standard, not particularly wealthy or fabulous town. But they poured their money into creating a very beautiful, very prominent synagogue. But it's got a few strange things in it. Okay, the strangest one is over here on the left. I don't know if you can see it so well. I hope you can. This lovely lady who's having a very bad hair day, right? Can you see her? Okay, this is Medusa, right? Medusa, Greek myth, right? She looks at uh, she looks at Hercules. I have to remember my Greek myths, right? And her face makes everybody you know, die, freeze. What is this doing in the synagogue? Um, this is doing in the synagogue. We're going to get to the question of images in just a minute. These are people who are living in this world, living in this Greek Roman culture, uh, perhaps not assigning any religious or mythological significance to this, and therefore not finding it particularly problematic to put this in a synagogue. 
it's a decoration. It's a style, right? It, it's just something pretty. Uh, there might be more to it than that, right? But uh, but that seems to be what's going on because we don't have anything that indicates that there's any pagan worship going on here. The other thing that's a fascinating piece of furniture, and we found this in a few places, is this thing on the right here, uh, which you can see it has an inscription on it, Dachur Latov, uh, remembered for good. Yudin ben Yishmael, Sha'asa et Astav Hazev, Madregotem, Mirchusho, Yelo Chelek im Tzadikim. Right? What is this? this? Is an inscription saying, Thank you, Mr. Yudin ben Yishmael, that you paid for the steps and you paid for the, the uh, main part of the sanctuary. Right? Remember in Fiddler on the Roof when Tevya says, I want to have a seat by the eastern wall? Right? Does he want to have a seat that has his name, Tevya, inscribed on it? Maybe. That seems to be what this is. This is called a Cathedra de Moshe. Uh, we hear about it in literature. We also find it in a few other places. Uh, a cathedra literally means an armchair. So, for example, the Mishnah in Ketubot talks about uh, if a woman is wealthy enough that she has four servants, she doesn't have to do any work in the house. Yoshevet be cathedra. She can sit and she can just sit in her armchair. Right today, a cathedra in modern Israel is like a place where you go and study. Um, but what what is this kind of a thing right what is it is it a place for the gvir right for the wealthy guy who gave money which seems to be indicated by this inscription is it a place that maybe you would rest the safer torah on could it be a place that the the talmid chacham right or the rabbi is sitting it's a very interesting question right we have some references to um to think to ideas like this, right? When Rabbi Eliezer ben Horkinus dies, Rabbi Yoshua, his contemporary, comes and he kisses the stone where Rabbi Eliezer sat. And he says, the stone is Har Sinai, is Mount Sinai. And the person who sits around on it is the Aron Habrit. So maybe this is something that is meant to put the Torah on. It's enthroning the Torah. Maybe it's even something that is compared to what you have in churches, where churches are enthroning Jesus. We, of course, don't have Jesus. We have the Torah. It's a very interesting piece of furniture we find it in a few places. We don't know enough about it yet, okay? Um, but a cathedra de Moshe. Now let's spend a few minutes talking about imagery, okay? So we already saw some images. We're going to see some more. Uh, Medusa, it's a pretty wild one. Uh, we're going to see some zodiacs as well as others. Uh, and the question is, is, is this kosher? Is this treif, right? Are you allowed to do this in a synagogue? Most Orthodox synagogues today will have imagery of animals or decorations, flowers, right? Often not, not people, okay? Uh, a very interesting example is um, the Tunisian synagogue. If anybody's been in the Tunisian synagogue up in Akko, where they have pictures of people, but they have no faces, okay? This idea of what is allowed in imagery is a, is a fascinating one, right? So where does the prohibition come from? It's the second commandment, right? No, make any kinds of idols or pictures of something that's in the sky, something that's on the ground, absolutely nothing, right? In the 10 commandments. That seems pretty simple, but you know, Jews, we like to complicate things. Um, and throughout history, people have interpreted this in different ways, okay? So for, for example, in the late second temple period, we have no imagery at all, right? We're gonna see here in our Byzantine period, we've got all kinds of imagery, right? In our Tunisian synagogue in the 20th century, we've got people with without faces. We even have my favorite example is in medieval Europe, you have a Haggadah that's called the bird's head Haggadah, right? Because it has people who have the heads of birds and not of people. People interpreted this differently in different times. So the rabbis, of course, try to pin this down, right? And they try to figure out what are we talking about, right? So the Mishnah in Avarzara seems to be very clear. Rabbi Meir says, all statues, first of all, statues, 3D. 3D is not the same as an image right? Something that's freestanding. All statues are forbidden since they are worshipped once a year. That's Rabbi Meir. The rabbis say, mm, no, no. The only ones that are forbidden are those with a staff or a bird or a ball. Why? Because all of those are symbols of uh, rulership, right? Of royalty. If you're holding a 
staff, if you're holding a ball or a globe, right? All of that makes you look like uh, a king. So that's forbidden. Rabbi Shimon ben Gamliel says holding anything is forbidden. Okay, so we're trying to make a sense of an objective Isser, right? But then we have this other very famous Mishnah. Maybe the Isser, maybe the, the prohibition is not a specific thing, but it's contextual, right? Where is this found? So we have this famous story. Proclus, the son of Plusfus, asked Rabban Gamliel at Aphrodite's bathhouse in Akko. Right? Now we know that the rabbis went to the bathhouse. We also know that bathhouses often had statues. And here we have Aphrodite, right? The goddess of beauty, Aphrodite, Venus, same thing, right? And and this guy comes up to Rabban Gamliel and he says, it says in the Torah, do not allow anything forbidden to touch you. How can you bathe in Aphrodite's bathhouse? Rabban Gamliel, come on, you're the Nasi, you're the head of the Sanhedrin. How are you coming into this place? So first, Rabban Gamliel gives a very classic Talmudic answer. We don't speak Torah in the bathhouse, <laughs> right? That's a great answer, but that's not a real answer. Um, but when he came out, he said, I have not come into her space. She has come into mine. Right, fascinating. We don't say let us make a bathhouse to beautify Aphrodite, but let us make Aphrodite to beautify the bathhouse. What's the point of my coming here? Am I coming to pray to Aphrodite? No, I'm coming to use the bathhouse. Somebody wants to put up a statue here? What do I care? That's not my business, right? But the other thing that he says is also very powerful. If I were to give you a lot of money, you still would not go into your house of idolatry naked and impure and urinate in front of the idol. And yet this one stands by the urinals and everyone urinates towards them in front of her. It says they're gods. If you behave toward them as gods, it is forbidden. If you do not behave towards them as gods, it is permitted, right? So what's the context? Rabban Gamaliel is trying to deal with the context. So is it a contextual thing? Is it an objective thing, right? Here we have another Gemara and Avodah Zara. Rabbi Shesh had said, pictures of the planets are uh, permitted except for the sun and the moon. All the faces are permitted except a human face. All figures are permitted except that of a dragon. Now, if you have all this discussion, all this conversation, it's clearly because people are doing these things, right? You're not conversing about it if nobody's doing it. So they're trying to kind of figure out a middle way, what's allowed, what's not allowed. And then we already have testimony here about what's happening. Rabbi Lazar ben Sadok said, all faces were in Jerusalem except a human face. This is not the law. This is reality. This is what we saw, right? Um, the Talmud Yerushalmi says in the days of Rabbi Yochanan, they began drawing on the walls and no one stopped them, right? And, and my favorite source here, which is a fascinating source, also because it's coming from two different time periods, right? It's the Gemara, but then it's Rashi and Tosfot, which is separated by many, many centuries. So the Gemara says, the rabbis taught writing under a painting or an image may not be read on Shabbat, right? This is a very interesting question about Shabbos. If you read something, will you come to write it? That's, that's a Shabbos law, right? But as for the image itself, one may not look at it even on weekdays, okay? So Rashi explains what does it mean, the writing? And here we have a great example of very early titles, right? When people draw on a wall unusual creatures or images of people doing things like the Battle of David and Goliath, and they write underneath what it is, right? Captions is great. Great uh, comics, right? Um, but then it says you can't have an image. You can't even look at it on weekdays, right? What you do from your own understanding. But then look at the toast vote, right? Toast vote, give or take eight, nine hundred years ago. The image itself, one must not look at it on weekdays. It seems that if it is for idolatry, you may not. But for beauty, you may. I know that's a fascinating, fascinating distinction that Tosfos is making in, in a time that is very, very Christian where there's imagery all over, all around them. And he's saying, but wait a second, if it's just for beauty, maybe it's allowed. So as you can see, this is a very fluid question and different times, different mores. So if you look, for example, at the synagogue in Herodian and you look at the synagogue in Sipori, they are exceedingly different. No imagery at all, Second Temple times, tons of imagery, human as well as what we would say pagan even, zodiac, in, um, in later times, in Byzantine times, perhaps part of the answer is that Second Temple times, paganism is still very, very powerful. The Roman Empire is pagan, uh, and paganism is a threat. By the time we get to the Byzantine period, Christianity is ascendant, 
Um, people aren't praying to Medusa. People aren't praying to the Zodiac. These are images that are devoid of content. And if they're devoid of content, you can A, put them in your synagogue because they don't mean much, or B, put new content into them. Um, and that's where you get this very, very interesting theory about why we have zodiacs uh, in the synagogue. Okay, so we have zodiacs because zodiacs, this is a theory of Zev Weiss from uh, the excavator in Sipori. He says, what is a zodiac? A zodiac is not a pagan symbol. A zodiac, and you can see these are zodiacs from uh, Hamat Feria and Beit Alpha and Sipori. A zodiac is a way to show the sun, the moon, the stars, the planets, the, the seasons. This is a way to show God. Because you can't show God, you can't have an image of God, but you can't have something that is nature, that is seasons, that is rain. And that's the way you are showing God. And, and there's a beautiful Midrash, Bamid Baraba, where it says, Merkavto Argaman, his carriage, God's carriage is purple. This is the sun that is placed above and rides in a chariot and lights up the world. Take a look at these mosaics in the center of the zodiac is an image of Helios, the sun god, being carried on a chariot. This is exactly what the Medrash is saying. The sun is in a chariot and it lights up the world. And he is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber. And from the power of the sun, the rain falls. And from the power of the sun, the earth gives fruit. And therefore it is called Argaman. God made it to weave, la arog, hey, man. Man is fruit, right? So the sun makes things makes the world work, but the sun is powered by God. So when you want to say, God, you made a promise to us with the binding of Isaac, and you're going to fulfill that promise and rebuild the temple. How do you show the God who's going to fulfill that promise? You make the Zodiac in the middle because the Zodiac is a way to represent God in a way that's representational because we don't represent God, right? Uh, and Zev Weiss says, that's exactly what we're saying in the first blessing of the Shvon of the Amida prayer that we're saying in the Big Nesset. What are we saying, right? Blessed are you, God of our fathers, God of Abraham, the great, mighty, and awesome God, right? That's this, who remembers the good deeds of the fathers, that's the binding of Isaac, and brings a redeemer to their children. And he's going to bring the Gula, he's going to bring the redemption. So that's a beautiful explanation by Zev Weiss, why you have a Zodiac in a synagogue. I think it's very nice. Some people don't like it, but you can like it. Okay, we're going to do a last couple of things. Um, a few synagogues that have been discovered much more recently in the last decade or so, okay? One is they're both very close to each other. Uh, they're just a little bit north of Tiberias uh, by the cliffs of Arbel. Um, one is Wadi Hamam, okay? uh, not very far from Migdal, very close to, uh, to Migdal. It was one of the very early synagogues. It was destroyed already in the fourth century. Okay? These are the cliffs of Arbel over here uh, on the left. Um, and uh, it's an amazing synagogue because it's got these great mosaics. So as we said before, it's one of the earliest, it, it, it so far is the earliest synagogue that has mosaics in it, but it also is not the mosaics that we see before. Not Zodiac, not temple imagery, not binding of Isaac, but all kinds of different pictures that we don't have in other places. So we've got these builders. Are they building the temple? Are they building the Tower of Babel? Unclear, right? These guys, what's going on here? This seems to be Samson fighting the Philistines, right? We go to Chukok, which is right next door. Also amazing, amazing uh, mosaics that are being discovered. This is slowly being uncovered uh, by Jody Magnus and the University of North Carolina. And they keep finding more and more panels. This is a later synagogue, fourth to sixth century. And they're finding these crazy images. Also builders, right? Also this great story of Jonah, Right, we've got Jonah being swallowed by multiple big fish. Okay, another Samson picture, Samson with the gates of Gaza uh, on his shoulders. Um, and this one, which is one of the most intriguing ones, is this a biblical scene or is this maybe a scene that we have in the Gemara uh, of the high priest, right, Shimon Atzadik, who is confronting Alexander the Great? 
right? It's a famous, uh, famous story in the Gemara that talks about how Alexander the Great is coming and he's going to destroy the temple. And Shimon Atzadik goes out to meet him and Alexander gets off his horse and bows down before him. And when his soldiers say, what are you doing? Why are you bowing down to this Jew? And he says, well, he's, when I go out to battle, I see him in my dream before I go out to battle, right? So is that what's going on here? It's, it's a great question. We don't know, right? But it's not something that we've found anywhere in any other synagogue so far. So these are synagogues that are, are kind of groundbreaking and, and they're telling us that we don't really know as much as we think we know. Um, and I'll just finish with a quotation from Professor Yisrael Levine, who really has done so much research on the ancient synagogue. Um, and, and he kind of brings us to this idea of, well, how much does the synagogue reflect rabbinics, right, rabbinic law, and how much does it reflect what people did, and are those two things the same, right, so he says the synagogue meant more than any other Jewish institution of antiquity demonstrates a fascinating synthesis of Jewish and non-Jewish elements within a single framework, the integration of these elements in every aspect of the institution, from the physical dimensions of art and architecture to the spiritual dimension of liturgy, offers a glimpse into the diverse and dynamic nature of Jewish life at the time, socially, religiously, and culturally. And he goes on to explain that it doesn't always mean that they're following exactly what the rabbis are saying. Um, and often, we only get to hear the rabbis, right, through the texts. The rabbis are the ones who write the texts. But this is the people, and what did they put into their communities and what was important to them? So like I said, it's a question that is still, to a great extent, uh, an open book. But uh, I'll quote Professor Levine again, where he says, you know, if 70 years ago we were able to say Jewish art is X, Y, Z, we can't say that anymore because we keep on finding more and more examples of Jewish art that seem to break the rules. Okay, so let's take a look at questions for a moment and comments. Uh, uh, okay, not questions. Great article about Yavne. Yeah, Yavne is very, very interesting. Um, we talked about Yavne in the Mishnah class. I'm not going to go into it here, but yes, lots of new exciting discoveries there. Uh, synagogues from churches we discussed. Mary Magdalene we discussed. Um, facing Jerusalem we discussed. Um, Yes, we had a problem last week. You can look at the at the um, at the video. Perseus, thank you, not Hercules. Perseus, I have to review my Greek uh, mythology. Dura Europus has figurative art on the walls. Yes, Dura Europus is also very interesting and also very early. Yeah, that's a great example. I was sticking to Eretz Israel, but yes, very interesting example. Art exhibits in mikvahs. I don't know what that is referring to. You can write and tell us. Um, Zodiac image, right? Some people didn't like it. By the way, I will tell you that when I've gone to uh, the synagogues that have the Zodiac images, I went once to Tsipori with a very nice religious group of ladies and I finished teaching and I said, okay, guys, let's daven mincha. And they looked at me like I was crazy. We're not davening here. Here with this on the floor, you want us to daven, right? So they were very shocked by that. Um, so I can understand that they did not like the, the crab. Um, the shul with a pool excavation. I'm still not knowing what you're talking about. I'm sorry, you should talk. What was the letter H on the tunics? Yeah, so that's also, there's theories about it. I have to go back and look at it. I don't remember, but you can Google uh, Hulk Mosaic and I'm sure there's an article about it. But again, we don't know 100%. Um, who was the one who wanted to know? Yes, AY, what are you talking about? What's a shul with a pool excavation? I'm stopping the sharing. I don't know. Speak up or forever hold your peace. Um, okay, next week, people who have left already, remind them and they will send out a reminder. Next week, I cannot teach. Uh, so we're going to take a week off and we'll be back in two weeks. Um, so uh, everyone should have a Shabbat Shalom and uh, go learn some other stuff next week. All right. Thank you, everybody. Bye bye. The B. Alex Stockshul has a zodiac. That's so interesting. Okay. Good. Thank you, Julie. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day. Good Shabbos. You too.